um, today is we're talking about anxiety um, and depression in youth, um, children, and adolescents. And I want to just kind of define for you what children and adolescents are. So I consider adolescents to be um, anyone who's, you know, and the numbers can change, but um, and developmental, developmentally where kids are can be a little bit different. So not every 12-year-old um, is going to be the same. So from right about um, 12 to, so right around 12 to, um, I would say, 24. And does anyone know why I would say 24? Oh, this is a pretty savvy group, so I'm sure you've got that down. But anyone want to jump in? When the frontal lobe is fully developed. That's yeah. right. <laughs> so when they have their prefrontal lobe. So normally we would say about 19. But um, adolescence really, I think, continues into that 24 to 25 age where that um, they're still learning, their brain is still growing. And of course, that doesn't mean our brains stop as adults. Hopefully not. We continue to change um, and our brains continue. So we think of preteen really, which is um, about the age, you know, um, I would say right around 10 to 13, nine to 13. So they start to have some cognitive ability and they can talk more openly um, about their, their feelings and their ability to have more concepts. And I'm imagining, and please correct me if I'm wrong, many of you are mentoring youth who were probably in that preteen to um, adolescent age. Anyone here mentoring younger kids? Okay. Amy, do you feel comfortable saying the age? Our program um, has kids who are grade three. Uh, we bring, we take in kids who are grade three to eight. So we have kids as young as eight in our program. Yep. Go ahead. And we have kids as young as five in our program. Excellent. So the differences in that is, is their language ability, their, their concepts, their ability to understand abstract concepts. Um, life can be pretty concrete for, for younger kids um, and their ability to talk about how they feel really goes down. So when we're talking about anxiety and depression um, for younger kids, it's going to look a little bit different in how um, that presents than it would if it's an adolescent who is able to say more and talk more about how they're feeling. A young kid, you might see they might be getting into more trouble. They might be um, feeling a little bit more anxiety and that comes out in their behavior that comes out and they might be irritable. Um, so it's really important sometimes crying, they're crying and they don't always can't say why. So the way that you look for depression and anxiety might be just a little bit different. So I wanna talk a little bit about anxiety first um, and let's understand what anxiety is. So anxiety is a normal feeling that we have um, that helps keep us motivated and helps keeps us out of danger. So we wanna, we wanna do things to please people around us and anxiety kind of helps us to, to meet some of those social expectations that we have and it also helps keep us safe. So some anxiety is actually really helpful um, and, it, and it helps keep us on track. When anxiety becomes too much or overwhelming, um, is when it starts to become a problem. And also anxiety is a problem for us when, um, when we have what's called clinical anxiety. So I wanna make a, we all sort of use depression and anxiety, ADHD, um, a lot of these disorders that children might have, we kind of use them sometimes with normal feelings. Um, when sadness is a very normal feeling, it's a normal response to, to things and as is anxiety is a normal feeling that we can have. Um, when it becomes a problem is when we start to feel those things um, when it doesn't necessarily seem logical. And I, what I wanna say about that um, is uh, when I say not logical, I don't wanna say that it doesn't make sense for the person to have those feelings. Because when you have a feeling, you have a feeling. You have no control over what feelings you have. It may not always fit the situation or the environment. And that's when we start to think about perhaps 
that level of anxiety is um, moves into more of an anxiety disorder if that's repeated and constant. Um, and it starts to have some negative impact on your life. Um, so I'll give you an example. If I don't really like roller coasters and I decide, you know, I'm not going to ride roller coasters, for the most part, that's probably not going to negatively impact my life. If I say I really don't like going to school and that makes me anxious, so I'm not going to go to school, that is going to really negatively impact my life. And so just to, again, um, my, my presentation style, I'm not really a stand and deliver person. I like to interact. So um, what would you say are some of the signs and symptoms of depression, anxiety you've seen in kids that you've worked with that stand out? Um, unable to focus and, and regulate. Mm -hmm. That's a really good one. Your brain is doing a lot of work when it's worrying and it's constantly thinking about what bad things are happening. And that, that takes a lot of energy away from being able to do normal everyday things. And it makes you tired. That's a great one. What else? Change in the number um, of discipline referrals. Yep. Yep. Definitely increases um, kids' irritability. Their social skills go down. They're getting grumpy with other kids. They might yell, say things they don't like. Um, they might avoid things that you don't want them to avoid. They don't pay attention as well. So yeah, it can definitely cause problems. That's a great one. What else? Um, you may see like a sudden disinterest in things that they previously liked to do or um, more or less a disinterest in quote unquote fun activities that they would have liked to do beforehand, let's say mm -hmm. playing sports or art things. Yep. And when it comes to anxiety, those sometimes they're avoiding for certain reasons. Um, their social anxiety is a big one. Sometimes younger kids have separation anxiety where they, they don't want to be away from their parents and they're really afraid to go out and do things without their parents. Um, and so they'll, they won't do activities, other, other options, other things that people see. I've seen uh, like physical withdrawal. Like I had a, uh, was working with a kid who all, all, like had a hoodie up and like both like staying away from people mm -hmm. um, and physical distancing even. I don't want to be seen. I just want to blend into the network, into the background. Yep. And sometimes habitual habits. Like repetitiveness. Yep. Say more. Um, you know, it's like you'll see a kid um, kind of touching something over and over and over. Um, just some repetitive behaviors. Yep. Biting your lip, sometimes mm -hmm. chewing your fingernails, yep. um, chewing your cheek, which I'm doing right now. <laughs> yep. Chewing your cheek. Those are all really good ones. Um, and sometimes I like to think of like obsessive compulsive disorder as, uh, and there are two different types. There's things, types with anxiety, and then there's types that um, are not as anxiety related, but I think all obsessive compulsiveness is a way to manage anxiety. So, and we all have some, uh, some of these traits we have in ourselves and kids will have, that doesn't necessarily mean they have a disorder. I, I mean, how many of us have left the house and been like, I know I shut the stove off, but I just can't. I can't get it out of my head that I might've done that. So we have to get out of the car, go back in the house and just double check to make sure the stove was off. Like we all do that to some extent. So sometimes those behaviors really help kids um, manage that anxiety. If they feel like, you know, I can do this and it helps me. Um, and sometimes those behaviors get in the way and we try to challenge them to stop. Don't do that. Um, and, uh, those sometimes are ways of coping. And so we can talk more about what are some healthy coping skills versus some negative coping skills that we can help kids uh, work on. But I would say sometimes if they have a negative coping skill before we force them to stop, we want to replace it with a positive coping skill because it is a coping skill, whether it's negative or positive. Hopefully that makes sense. Any other signs or symptoms that, that we're missing? 
change in eating habits? Say more. Yep. Um, I don't know. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. So uh, maybe lack of hunger um, or more hunger. And you'll notice as we talk about depression, a lot of these symptoms are similar um, in that, you know, appetite is, can be an issue. Um, there are a lot of physical symptoms related with anxiety and kids, this, you might see this more than you will see some of the emotional symptoms. So, um, for example, their stomach, a lot of nausea, even throwing up, um, can be a problem. Kids who are, you know, have anxious anxiousness at school, parents will often struggle with, you know, they, they have stomach aches. Um, and those are real. They're not lying about those. It's their body's physical um, manifestation of the anxiety that they're feeling. And we can talk more about the fight or flight response. But um, yeah, other symptoms you can think of? I mean, sort of on the extreme end of the spectrum, um, but things that you do see in youth that are mentored is uh, kids who have feelings of self-harm. Yep. Yep. And we're going to talk a little bit about suicidality today and self-harm. And I want you to know those things are different. I like to think of self-harm as a negative coping skill. So mm -hmm. they can be related. It doesn't mean a kid who is engaged in self-harming isn't suicidal. However, it also doesn't mean that they are. So if they're engaging in self-harm, I would call that a negative coping skill. And unfortunately, it's one that works. I like to think of it as the negative meditation. So when, uh, when kids harm themselves, it allows them to focus in the moment. That pain helps them, the physical pain helps them to get out of their, their struggle with their emotional pain. And so meditation does the same thing. If they practice it regularly, then it helps them to stay focused in the moment. And when we're worrying and we're anxious, we're not in the moment, we are in the future. Um, we're spending our time in the future or the past worrying about things that we did or worrying about things that are going to happen or we will do. Um, and so self-harm can sometimes be that, um, that coping skill that helps them get out of their head for a little bit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any questions about that one? We can talk a little bit more about that as we go along. Um, these are great. Other other signs of anxiety. Um, they may not want to, like since I'm an after school program, they may not want to go home, especially when it's time to go home, or they may not want to get picked up, or they want to stay a lot longer for certain reasons because they wouldn't want to go home. Yep, and there could be. That's a really great one, and there can be so many. Um, reasons why kids don't want to go home. Transitions can be really tough for kids sometimes. Adults have trouble trans transitioning. So when kids want to, um, they're really into an activity and they don't want to stop, or it may be an indication that there's something at home that they don't feel safe or they're worried about. And in that case, it's really important to, to ask some questions about what's, what, um, what they're worried about. Great. Um, I do just want to point out when we're talking about the signs and symptoms for anxiety that there really are physical symptoms and there are um, psychological symptoms and then there are behavioral symptoms. So all those things that you mentioned kind of fit into one of those three categories. And I would say um, sometimes people, people say, about mental health disorders that, you know, it's all in your head. Well, that's really not true. It is very much, um, you know, and, and, and in the past, you know, I think 80s and 90s, the mind body uh, sp spirit connection was all very important. And I think in some scientific realms, I would say um, there isn't a difference between those things. The mind body <laughs> spirit is kind of the same. So, um, these uh, anxiety and depression are felt very much physically as they are mentally. Um, and some of their causes are biological and not just mental. Um, our thoughts and our feelings 
can change our physiology Mm -hmm. and our physiology can change our thoughts and our feelings. So I just want to point out to help take some stigma out of that, that, um, you know, these things are all connected both physically and they can have both physical and psychological, um, physical and psychological sources. However, they're all very real. So there's no mental disorder that's really just in your head. Um, it is a, both a physical and a psychological experience for kids. And, and some of those things are and are not in their control, if that makes sense. Okay, what about depression? Again, we're going to have a lot of the same, same signs and symptoms here. Withdrawal. Withdrawal. Yep. Avoidance. That's a big one for both anxiety and for depression. Yep. Sometimes um, like lack of clarity and thought. Mm-hmm. Yep. We know that both depression and anxiety can interfere with um, a child's ability to function in school, their thought processes, um, their ability to remember things, um, their cognition gets damped, they can, their memory isn't as good when, um, when they're struggling with anxiety and depression. So you're gonna see some academic performance issues. Um, on our best days, we, we are good at uh, regulating our emotions. And when we're feeling highly anxious or depressed, we don't do those things as well. We're not as motivated, we're more tired. Um, and so, Sometimes our, when we recognize that, our expectations might need to be adjusted a little bit for, for students who are struggling with anxiety and depression. And I would imagine with older youth, uh, maybe the increase of substances would be to mask your depression. Yes, and some of you with older mentees, um, I think, unfortunately, uh, middle school um, and high school are really the biggest areas of worry there. That doesn't mean that um, younger kids don't experiment or get access to those things. Um, but definitely you'll see that if kids start to drink or use. Um, in fact, in my work with kids with, uh, with marijuana, like usually I like to ask kids, why do you use? Because that really gives me an understanding of what their motivation is that makes them use. And I expected that kids wouldn't be savvy enough to, uh, to say I'm using because I have anxiety, but I was completely wrong. Most kids would say, I really am anxious a lot. I have social anxiety and marijuana is the only way to, to help me do that. Um, and unfortunately in the short term, alcohol and marijuana and, and other drugs, they increase our pleasure centers in our brain, and it does make us feel better for a short time. It's just the after effects and of course the consequences um, of those things that are a problem. So I would kind of put those under the negative coping skills um, and like self-harm, they work. You know, uh, when we all know when you get drunk, it feels, you know, it's a good time and it feels good until it doesn't. It's the after effects that come in and, um, and kids don't always associate some of, especially with marijuana, some of the after effects that they're feeling. So they'll just keep using. So they'll start to feel more anxious. And, and I think that, you know, marijuana tends to make kids more anxious um, when they're not using and increase their anxiety, but they don't notice that. They just think they need to smoke more. So they're not associating those feelings with, um, with the marijuana. And so they think that marijuana is a good solution for their anxiety and really it's making it worse or exacerbating it. That was a good one. Any other uh, depression? Um, They may be like on the other side because I know people think like depression is like staying at a dark room and crying, but there's also like wanting to always be seen or like random acts to like get attention, you know, it's like Mm -hmm. acting out of turn and things like that. And sort of like trying to act, especially if it's like a student that doesn't act that way, but just randomly like looks for new ways to maybe pick up, like, you know, look, you know, what's the word? Random outbursts to make the class laugh or things of that nature. Like, yep, they're looking for attention. They're looking for attention, validation. Absolutely. 
Um, and if it's negative versus positive, if they can get positive, great. If it's negative, they're gonna look for that too. Um, attention is attention. Does depression sometimes um, manifest as anger? Absolutely. So ir I'm being a little stereotypical here, but um, men tends, tend to have more, um, show more anger and irritability um, than, than women, where women, you might see more sadness and women have, you know, again, I'm being generalizing and this is not always true. Um, it's more socially acceptable for women to talk about feelings. And so they might talk about feeling sad where men, you know, um, and there are words I wouldn't necessarily use with men. Like, are you feeling afraid right now? And that for men, that can be a trigger. I might be, what are you worried about? Um, instead of what do you fear? Cause you know, men aren't supposed to be afraid of things. Um, and, uh, so yeah, sometimes those and young kids, sometimes they don't have the ability to express their feelings. So irritability is definitely something that can, that can come out in young children. Great question. Other symptoms of depression that, um, that you might see in your kids. Weight gain, weight loss. Appetite changes, um, eating and um, overeating and under eating. Yep. Gaining weight, losing weight. Absolutely. Those also can be signs of um, eating disorders. So questions, and we'll talk a little bit more about, and my goal for today is not to make you mini therapists. It's to um, help you have some understanding of what these disorders look like and to help you have some compassion, which you all have in spades, I know, um, and to give you some ability to be like a first responder um, and, and get the help that they need and respond in um, really appropriate ways, but not necessarily as therapists. But, but do know if, you know, there are things that if you hear kids talking about, um, especially young girls, but also young men are starting to also feel the pressure of society and uh, talking about their weight, how they look. Um, adolescents are very self-conscious to begin with. So there's a lot of pressure for them and how they look and they get a lot of negative feedback, sometimes sadly from parents um, and sometimes um, often from their peers and definitely the media. So if you're hearing those things and you're seeing changes in weight, then that, that could be an issue. Um, great, any other symptoms or side effects you wanna throw out? Um, I, I would say like during middle school and high school, there is the, um, over attachment to a sexual partner or even just the idea of like your sexual orientation, whether or not be heteronormative being sort of like not accepted by peers. And then, and, uh, I don't even know how to like sort of word that in a way, but mm -hmm. then there is the idea like, you know, if every, if all your peers are having sex or you're not attractive or things of that nature, or they look towards attaching themselves to another person to sort of give them that validation that they probably seek or they're, they're not getting in another place. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I'm hearing a couple of things there. I think I'm hearing low self-esteem. Um, so that need for external validation, which, you know, teens are very prone to anyway. And sometimes relationships, um, they can look for that in relationships and relationships are super important to teens uh, and youth. If anyone who's been around a teenager knows that that's their favorite thing to talk about. Um, and they're one of their biggest worries. And so, you know, certainly, and unfortunately teens can, um, can also fall prey to destructive relationships. So um, abusive relationships can happen for teens. And those are things that I think as a mentor, you are probably gonna hear about and see things um, and, and and be able to respond to some of those things as well. Um, good. So just to sum up again with depression, it is um, a combination of um, physical symptoms, tiredness, lack of energy, 
um, and psychological and body aches even. Sometimes it can feel like the flu. And for young men, this might be, um, this might be the presentation that you notice the most. Um, withdrawing from things, some of those behavioral um, signs and symptoms, um, negative talk, negative thinking patterns, putting themselves down a lot. Those are things that you're going to start to notice um, and, and you'll be a little bit worried about. So um, it would be, a, it's also a good way using those signs and symptoms to, to check in and just say, like, I've noticed like, you know, you haven't eaten today, or um, I've noticed you've really put yourself down a lot. I'm just wondering what what's what's going on with that. Um, and so some of those some of those signs and clues, even if it's not depression, at least you're asking about them if you notice them. And uh, and if you're wrong, that's totally okay. It's okay to ask these questions. And then um, and then it really can start the conversation about how they're feeling. Um, Okay, so I want to talk a, a little bit about stress and anxiety and the brain. So, because I want you really to understand what happens when kids are feeling anxious or depressed, um, especially we have what's called, and I, I apologize, I can't get the PowerPoint to work, but I will send that out to you. Um, when I talk about fight or flight. And so what's happening in, in anxiety is um, we sort of have this, uh, we have this logical brain, which is the prefrontal cortex. And then we have the illogical um, emotional brain, which is the amygdala. And the amygdala is really important. So what it does um, is it's responsible for being our warning system. It's constantly tracking for danger and it's picking up memories. So every television show we watch, every experience we've had, and it matches it up for possible danger. So it says, oh, I've, I've seen this situation before and it was bad. So our amygdala needs to respond quickly to things. So if I'm, if I'm being confronted by a cave bear or a lion out in the wilderness, um, like in the old caveman days, I don't want my prefrontal cortex to sit and think about all the possibilities and tell me everything going on. I'll be eaten by the time that gets done. So the amygdala's job is to respond quickly. And it's also very powerful. Emotions will trump logic any day. So um, while we do have the ability to logically think our way out of anxiety um, and depression, it's a, it's a much easier for those, those negative thoughts and those uh, emotions of fear are much more strong and, and they tend to have more influence. So it takes a lot to get to break through that cycle. So, um, so telling someone just to stop feeling scared or anxious, and I, I'm sure all of you know this, it's not helpful. So if someone's having a panic attack and you're like, oh, just calm yourself down, like, just do it. You'll be okay. Um, I saw a comment once uh, from someone saying a teacher once said that they picked on them in class and the teacher responded to them that I'm picking on you because I know you're, you're anxious about it. And so this is helping you and not a helpful response. Um, so what happens is our, our brain really tells us that there's our amygdala tells us there's something scary and it starts to respond. So it tells the body to go into fight or flight mode. So, our blood starts pumping, um, you know, our, our digestion stops, and anything that's related to non-safety things kind of shut down and all the energy in our body goes towards dealing with the emergency. And our logical brain doesn't get to engage in this process. This is the amygdala just says, I see something that's a potential danger and it throws our body into this, this mode of panic or you know, fright to give us the extra strength, the extra energy in order to manage this uh, crisis. Now, unfortunately, it's often wrong. It's not a crisis. And when people having anxiety disorders, um, you know, anxiety is designed to go away quickly. Um, 
we we get anxiety, we get fears, we figure out it's okay, we run, we fight, we flee, we deal with the problem, the bear goes away, we got away from it, and then our body starts to return to normal. Well, in our society today, things don't always go away. That test is going to come. Our feelings of inferiority, our feelings that we've let people down, those don't go away quickly. And so our feelings for those can stay for a long time. Um, our fear can be ramped up for a long time and our body isn't really designed to, to, to be in the fear state full time. And it really takes its toll. And that's where you see fatigue, um, lack of energy. And uh, really sometimes when I'm talking to kids, uh, they'll get really down on themselves because they feel like, um, why am I so depressed all the time? Why am I so anxious? I'm really, you know, and, and they'll get upset that they're not doing as well in school, that they're not doing as well socially. And I say, you know, sometimes it's kind of like you're doing what normal kids do, but you're doing it with a 50 pound weight around your neck. And so they're really working harder. They have to work so much harder than someone who's not struggling with these disorders in order to, to manage normal life. So having a lot of empathy for them and, and helping them have some empathy in themselves and say, you know what, you're really working on managing your depression or your anxiety. And you're really, that's a lot. That's not easy. And it makes the things that you have accomplished all that more impressive that you're able to go to school every day that, you know, you, you got, a, you know, a B plus on that test was really good considering, you know, all night you were struggling with difficult feelings of sadness and anxiety, and you still managed to do well on that test. That was pretty amazing. So using, um, really looking for their strengths as well as um, some of the things that aren't working and helping them to shift their focus into, you know, you're really doing a good job with this. Um, so part of the solution for anxiety um, when our body is ramped up like that, and anxiety happens over time, there's a number of different types of manifestations of anxiety that you might see in kids. Some of them have general anxiety where they're just worried about the future. They're worried about their parents, what's happening in their family. They're worrying about school, their friends, and just this constant like stuck in what might be happening in the future and not uh, and struggling to be sort of here in the moment and to let those things go. Um, versus someone who might be pa having panic attacks, where in the moment, their body is really, really um, expressing a lot of panic. And, um, and so getting them to calm down is really important and finding ways to help them to do that. And I've got a few ideas for you um, as we move on. So, and then helping them to understand that um, what their body is doing so that they understand you're kind of stuck in fight or flight mode right now. Your body's alarm is going off and telling you that something terrible is happening. And your logical brain is trying to catch up and say, you know, this really might not be as bad um, as I think it is. And, and having that awareness that I'm having anxiety and oftentimes the things that I'm afraid of when they happen aren't nearly as bad as what I thought they would be, but the anxiety makes it so much worse. I often tell kids, I say that um, the thing that you're afraid of only happens once, but the, the time that you think about it, you really suffer a lot in those, you know, two weeks before this big test comes, all that suffering about anxiety and thinking about it, you've suffered a lot versus just the, what it, what it costs to go through the test. Um, so helping kids have some rationality, and then I think helping them to really be able to manage um, and tolerate some of their feelings, letting them know that um, no one has ever died of a panic attack um, and panic goes away. Your body can naturally help you to manage that. So sometimes it's helping um, youth to accept those feelings and recognize that they can act despite those feelings. One example I like to use with, with kids is that um, our brain, our mind is somewhat like going to a movie theater. When you're in the movie theater and you're watching a movie, there are times when you are part of that movie. 
You don't recognize that you're in a theater. You don't recognize that you've got popcorn on your lap. You are just in that experience fully. And then there are times when you eat some popcorn and you take a drink and you recognize I'm back in the theater and I am myself. So with anxiety, sometimes it's having that ability to step back and say, my body is feeling anxious. Um, I'm having anxious thoughts. I'm having feelings of fear, but I'm still able to think and I'm still able to be here despite those things. So they have a moment where they can separate them, themselves a little bit from those feelings and from um, those struggles. And then that gives them the ability to sort of make some choices to think about what they're thinking. Can I change my negative thinking? Um, how do I calm? How do I take some steps to calm my body down right now? Um, so it gives them that little separation of themselves to be able to, to make some choices or to start maybe taking some steps. Does that make sense? Any questions about that? And that's really why things like meditation are really powerful because they allow um, people to, to sort of get that space um, where they can notice that they are not their thoughts. They're actually separate from their thoughts and their thoughts don't equate them. Um, so sometimes we might all have really terrible thoughts in our heads that are just thoughts. They're not really us. Um, and we, we sometimes call those um, stuck thoughts when people have uh, thought disorders where they feel like they're, they think of these terrible things, like they might think, man, I just want to kill that person. And then they think, oh my God, I'm a terrible person. I just had that thought. And really they're just thoughts. You're not a terrible person because all of us who've had a terrible thought in our head, if we were in prison for that, we'd all be in jail, right? Um, so really helping, helping youth to think about, yeah, go ahead. I have a question about, um, you know, what mentors should do if they're faced with resistance, right? If they sort of make an approach to try and, and use some of the suggestions that you've made and they get sort of the like pushback from kids um, mm -hmm. and, and sort of how to deal with that in the that's moment. A, that's a great question. And I think for some of what we've been talking about, understanding anxiety and depression, I think for, for kids to understand what anxiety and depression is, is really helpful. So when you can sort of be compassionate and explain to them what's happening in their body, um, that, you know, you're feeling really panicked and remind them of, you know, hey, remember that thing you did last week that you did really well, um, you know, or that time you were really worried about something and it went okay. Um, or, and if you're not sure, you can ask them those questions. And that helps them to sort of get to the point where you can then start suggesting things. And if they're resistant, I think um, that means they're not quite ready. Um, so what you can do is if they're, and I believe in this word I call challenge by choice and a lot of the work I've done, um, the idea is to provide, help them come out of their comfort zone with enough support. If there's not enough support and we force them to come out of their comfort zone, then we're gonna get bad results. So if there's enough support and they can take a risk safely, then that's when they're gonna have success. So you need to make sure there's enough support there um, and so really, and that has to be the child's choice. So sometimes in the moment, you're not going to win. Like you really want them to, you know, let's go to the library together. And they're like, I don't want to go to the library. That's a scary place for me. Um, then you don't want to force them to do anything. You want to encourage them and to say, okay, so let's ask some questions. What's tough for you about the library? Um, and it, I think here it's really, really important to deeply respect, respect your mentee and what they're struggling with and to ask them good questions. So instead of like dismissing how they feel, if they say, you know, I'm really afraid to do that, well, you'll be fine. Like, let's just do it and you'll be okay. So that's not necessarily respecting 
how they're feeling. We want to hear how they feel and validate that and say, you know what? I know that's, that's really scary for you. I get it. And I usually never like to use the word, but with them, I try to catch myself. There are a couple of words I try never to use should, but, um, and why should usually is an expectation that if they don't meet it, they don't meet it. Um, that's my expectation, but usually negates everything I say beforehand. Um, if I say, you know, you did a really good job today, but you know, you could have done this better. The first part that I said goes away. They just focus on what they could have done better. So I like to use the word and in place of it. So I might say you're really, really scared and it, it, it it's really scary. I recognize it. Um, and what would it take? What a, What's a little step that we could take together that you could tolerate um, that might get us towards there? And you can give them the information that the dangerous part about anxiety is our natural inclination when we're feeling anxiety is to avoid what we're anxious about. And the way to heal anxiety is to move forward with that. So it's having conversations with your mentee, being patient and having conversations with them about how they're feeling um, and what little steps and working with them to negotiate what little steps might be safe for them because they wanna be successful. They wanna meet their challenges um, and they don't have the skills or the uh, ability to do that yet. So you're sort of helping them a little bit um, to be their prefrontal cortex. So you're saying, okay, so let's think about what might happen when you go in. Sometimes letting them see, because if they're afraid of something they don't understand, letting them see it first, like let's say, um, you know, a kid is struggling to go to school for the first time. Maybe we take them in before school starts and let them see what it looks like. So with a mentee, maybe we show them some videos of like what the library looks like, or, you know, we just poke our head in for a minute and then we walk right back out. So they, they get some level of experience with it. So it's not all 100% brand new. Um, and then they make, they take little mini steps and you can do that by encouraging them by genuinely um, celebrating their little successes. And then like we went out, we went out and you had a conversation with, uh, you know, we went out and bought something in a store and you had a conversation with the cashier. That was really awesome. I know talking to people is really hard for you. And you did a really great job at that. Um, and so rewarding them for the little things that they do, steps they make and helping them to say, you know, you've done really good at that. What could, you know, what would make that a little bit different? Uh, what would be the next step? You know, what if we were to go over and, you know, talk with that kid on the playground, if we're hanging out at the playground, what would it be like if you went and just said hi, and then came back? Um, and then you can talk about it. What was it like for you? What happened? So to help them process some of what they've experienced. You'd have to change it a bit for the middle school and high school kids, right? Because like what you're talking about, it sounds like you'd be working with a fairly young child. Yep, but it, it, the concept doesn't necessarily change. So it depends on what you're noticing. Um, sometimes uh, for youth, it's speaking up for themselves. It's for, you know, if, you know, and it's asking them to take little, little uh, steps. And it might be um, with older kids, cognitive things, you'll, you'll hear a lot more. And I call them cognitive distortions. And so we all do them. So those are kind of in the form of all or nothing thinking. So if I, um, if I did poorly on that test, then my world is over. Everyone's going to hate me. My parents are going to hate me. My teacher is going to be mad at me and my life is over. It's like, okay, well, let's, yes, that's really scary. And let's look at that a little bit. Um, do you know anyone who's ever failed a test before? And you're helping them to, um, to look at the way they're thinking and maybe ask them uh, to think about it a little bit differently. And sometimes you can be their prefrontal cortex and you can say, you know, hey, sometimes a little self-disclosure is really helpful. I failed a test once and I still, I still made it. Um, 
And, and how did I get through that? Well, I, I recognized what got in my way and I tried to do a little bit better. What do you think got in your way? Um, so you're asking them good questions. Uh, negative self-labeling, if they say, I'm really stupid. And sometimes kids will do that. They'll really get down on themselves if there's something they couldn't do or that's difficult. And so you kind of help them recognize, well, you know, and like with anxiety, a lot of times it's like, again, going back and saying, you're doing this, it's really hard. Other people don't necessarily have these same challenges. Um, and it's a lot easier for them. So you're comparing yourself to them when they might not have the same challenges that you're having. So you're working extra hard. So your results might be a little bit different. So it's not that you're stupid or that you're lazy or you don't know how to do something. It's that you're really struggling. And for you, it's going to take more work to figure out how do I do this than it might be for someone that that's not a challenge for. Does that make sense? I think of like a good example I've done with kids is, you know, when we've done ropes courses or rock climbing, where you've got those kids that they just zip right up and it's not a problem for them. And then you've got those kids that it's a real psychological challenge. Like facing that fear is really hard, but then they have strengths that those other kids can't do. So we all have different abilities and helping kids recognize that. And um, that sometimes they're all or nothing thinking can really get in their way or they're catastrophizing when they're like, the world is going to end if I do this, or if I messed up, I'm a terrible person. Well, really good people mess up all the time. So you're helping them to challenge some of their negative thoughts. And with depression, this is really helpful because um, those negative thoughts really start to um, really increase. And it's sort of like this vicious cycle where the more negative thoughts they have, the worse that they feel, the more depression they feel. And it just sort of feeds into itself. So helping break through those cycles of um breaking through those cycles of negative thinking. Um, and then avoidance behavior by you helping support them to take, like kids with social anxiety, um, the avoidance and letting them know when you avoid things, it kind of get worse and it makes it, does it make it harder for you when you avoid? It feels good to avoid because you get out of the, that immediately takes the fear away. But then you also tell me that you really want to make some friends. And so, and sometimes helping them recognize that sometimes those behaviors are self-fulfilling prophecies. So I noticed that you really avoid people, but you're saying that no one at school really likes you. Could it be that sometimes when you're avoiding that people don't get to really know you and they don't really get to see you for who you are? Um, so helping them challenge some of those thought processes. I don't know if that helps, Amy, but and I think as mentors, um, the more you can have these conversations and you can ask them open-ended questions, um, it can really help bring resiliency um, and, and you can kind of help be there, help them through those thought processes that are getting in their way. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, suicidality, if I could, for a moment. And a lot of this will go back to how you can be helpful. So again, you're not a psychiatrist, you're not a psychologist or a counselor. Your job is to be there. But um, I often work with peers and I, I train peers in um, how to help respond to their peers with suicidality because they're often the ones that are gonna hear it more than an adult, especially with um, older kids, um, adolescents. And unfortunately there is a trend that we're seeing where um, younger, younger kids are um, still, it's pretty low that um, children commit suicide, um, but we have seen an increase in that number. Um, and we know that suicidality um, is really big in, in teens and youth. So it's an important thing that you be able to, to understand. Um, so some signs of that, does anyone have any thoughts about what are some signs and symptoms that might, might trigger you to think that someone might be feeling suicidal? They might say, I'm feeling suicidal. They, all this talk we've ever heard say, they say it. They'll, if you ask them, are you feeling suicidal? They'll answer yes. Alice, that is absolutely right. That's a great one. 
And how do, how do adults, and this is not to say anything bad about adults, because often adults don't know how to respond. They're terrified when they hear that from a youth. So what's the typical response to that? They'll probably be like, yeah. why would you want to kill yourself? You got this, you got that. Like, you got this going on, you got that going on. Like, what, what's going on? Like, it kind of, your first response is negating the feeling rather than, yep. Or you you're, you're just being dramatic. Yep. Good one. Yep. Sometimes I hear, don't say that. Oh, don't talk like that. You know? Um, and, and a lot of times what we don't realize is when we try to, and you can notice this in people in conversations where people try to shut down conversations all the time because they're not comfortable with feelings. So they might not know how to deal with feelings. So rather than when someone opens up about something, they'll change the subject or they will um, minimize what's being said because they don't know how to do that. And I want to say suicidality can be really scary when someone says to you, um, I'm thinking about killing myself. That's really scary. And I imagine you're feeling like, I don't know what to do about this. Um, when that happens, I just want to make sure you all know, what, what are your resources? When that happens. I know a lot of kids also probably like use dark humor. Mm -hmm. Like they would be like how they say, uh, telling jokes to mask their true feelings. Like they would say, you know, oh, it'd be funny if I just fell on the stairs right now, right? And then think it's funny, but then there'll be some sort of truth to it. Yep. So they give you little hints that they might not be feeling so great or they're thinking about harming themselves. Awesome. I would also, say that, um, I was gonna say also in, in their artwork or in the music they're listening to, Yep. Or the way they're dressed, they might change the way they dress. Their appearance might change. Hygiene might go down the drain. So sometimes, I mean, you know, some of us have had some stinky, stinky mentees. And, and that's part of the conversation. But sometimes that's normal for them. And, uh, and that's a different conversation. And sometimes it's not normal. And when it's not normal, that could be a sign of some mm -hmm. depression or something going on. Um, what else? As regards your question of our resources available, I have to say, since we're a school-based program, we always, you know, very, very clearly tell our mentors, you know, when a conversation gets serious, here's a whole list of people to talk to. Do not leave this school building if this kind of a conversation is happening talk to the mentee. I really care about you. I know this is a confidential con conversation, but I'm really worried about you. Can we go talk to Alice? Can we go talk to the guidance counselor? Can we go talk to the principal together? And if they're not comfortable with that, are you comfortable with me going to talk to the guidance counselor now by myself? Yep. That's a great one. So you've got the first resource is, you know, obviously your, your, um, your supervisor or you know, your mentor coordinator who will help help direct you. And you should use your mentor coordinators for that kind of, for like, wow, I just had a conversation and I'm not sure how I handled it. I don't know how to feel about it. Like, you know, can you, can we talk about this? And you should definitely reach out because you guys don't, you know, kids, every time I think I've heard everything, kids come out with something new and I'm like, wow, okay, <laughs> here we go. Um, so your mentor coordinator is a really helpful resource. Also, there's always the crisis. So in Chittenden County, it's the Howard um, first call um, and 211 is a great resource to get to them if you're not sure what the numbers are. And I will post those. And if you're in Franklin County, then um, Northwest Counseling and Support Services and CSS is your, um, is your best. Uh, that is the uh, crisis number for that area. There are also lots of great hotlines that kids can use to call and just talk. So I'll put some suicide um, prevention hotlines up there. Um, but I want to talk Paul, about- sorry, Barbara had her hand up and I interrupted her. Oh, okay. I didn't mean to do that before there. Thank you. Alice, Please feel free to Alice help Alice said that. everything I was going to say. Okay. <laughs> yeah, just sorry. shout out if you have a question. If you have your hand up, I'm probably not going to see you because my screen is very limited right now. So um, I've had a little breakdown and 
on this uh, PowerPoint situation. So um, I can see a little square. So uh, so shout out if you have a question. Um, so I just want to be really clear at your role as a mentor in this situation is um, one thing that is absolutely okay to ask a, someone if they're feeling suicidal. You're not going to implant ideas in their heads. You're not going to, um, you're not going to make them do it, but just by asking and the things you can do that will never do any harm is if you listen and if you just reflect back what you're hearing. So I like the um, acronym ORS. So open-ended um, questions. So instead of asking yes or no questions, are you feeling sad? You know, they, they can say yes or no, and I don't get a lot of information. If I say, tell me how you're feeling, that's more open-ended. If I say, what's going on in your head right now? That's open-ended. And you're going to get more information that way. Um, and then, you know, reflect what you're hearing back to make sure it's right. To say, you know, I hear you're saying you're really, really sad. And I hear that. I want, you to know, I really hear that. Um, you're feeling helpless. You're feeling... Um, unsupported. And I really hear that. And, and you don't always, sometimes kids say things that maybe you don't agree with, but you can always affirm and validate what they're saying because it's their perspective. So uh, this happens a lot when kids are talking about their teachers or their parents, they might say, you know, my mom's a real jerk. And you're like, and I don't have to get on board with that and say, wow. Yeah. sounds like your mom's a total jerk there. Um, I might say, you know, I hear that you're really frustrated with your mom and that you're really angry with your mom. And regardless of whether the situation is their fault or their parents' fault or really usually no one's fault, but miscommunication, then um, you can validate their feelings without um, jumping on, on the bandwagon of, um, does that make sense? Um, so I also wanna talk about confidentiality. So I think it's really important if you haven't had this conversation with your mentees to have this conversation about what can be kept confidential and what can't be. And this is really when you work with the family, it's really important that you work with your um, mentoring coordinator and the family. As a therapist, I, I usually tell families that um, while they have the right, a mom has a right or a dad has a right to come in or a caregiver to ask what did you talk about in therapy? And I say, you have the right to ask me that. It's not necessarily a good idea. Um, I usually try to tell them, I will let you know if there's something that I'm really concerned about and I will work with the student to talk about that with you together. So I think um, sometimes your mentees may tell you things that they trust you and, and you're a safe person for them to talk about some of the things in their life. Um, they're frustrated with their parents, they're angry about something. And those are things you don't necessarily need to share. When it comes to uh, harming self or someone else, or, and I'm, I'm pretty sure you all know this uh, from your mentor training, that um, you wanna let them know up front what you can and can't talk about. And so when, when it comes to suicidality, I usually try to say, thank you for telling me. I really appreciate that. Um, I need help. And I usually try to keep things use I statements and keep it to what I need instead of telling them what they need to do because especially adolescents hate that. Um, so I try to say, I need to get help to help you. I'm worried and I don't know how to necessarily handle all this, but I really care about you and I wanna be part of getting you some help. So who do you trust? What teacher, what, or, you know, can we talk to your parents about this? You know, if you're out in a, um, on an outing with your mentee and you feel like, you know, I really think mom needs to hear this or dad needs to hear this or the caregiver, can we just take a few minutes and talk to them together? And what would you say? How can I help? So, um, but don't tell them you won't, you won't say anything because when it comes to suicidality, we gotta, we gotta do that. Um, some things you can ask, and I don't want you to be in a situation where you are assessing a kid for suicidality. That's not your role. But just so you know, there are some risk factors that you can ask them about. Do you know anyone who's you know, committed suicide in the past? And if they have, that's a warning sign. The biggest one you can ask is, you know, I hear you've been, and if they say, yeah, I've, I've been feeling suicidal, and you're like, have you thought about how you might do that? 
Um, and that might feel really awkward to ask. That's a personal and, and difficult question, but it's very, it's a very important question and it's okay to ask it and they won't be offended. And if they say, no, I haven't really thought about that, then they're at a little bit, and I, you know, you're not a judge. So that, that might put them at a little bit lower risk. Um, means is a huge thing. When it comes to suicidality, um, one thing that parents can do that's really important is to remove the means. The top means for suicide are guns, is the by far 50, over 50% 50 of all suicides are with guns. So if a kid is feeling that way, it's really important for if there are guns in the house to have them locked up and kids don't have access. The other one is um, uh, medications. So making sure that medications are locked away safely. And so if kids don't have means or access, it makes it harder. So you ask them, do you have a plan? And if they say yes, and you say, how would you do that? And if they say, well, my dad has a gun, then that's really immediate. And you need to, as a mentor, and, and it's okay to call and say, you know what, let's make a call together. Could we call crisis? If you feel it's so unsafe that you need to make a call right then and there, um, then it's okay to call mental health crisis and they'll ask the right questions and then help you navigate. How do I talk to the parent about this? Um, most of the times it's not going to come up. You're going to get little subtle hints and you ask them about that and you ask, who can you talk to about this that really, you know, you feel safe and will be supportive. Um, and this is really tricky, but sometimes maybe the parent isn't the safest person. Um, and that's when you really want to get your, your coordinator involved. If, if, a, if a kid shares that they feel unsafe with their parent, or if their parent knows that might not be safe for them, or there's some abuse happening, then um, you might want to, that's when using crisis or an and or and really reaching out to your mentor coordinator to let them know and ask them for advice. Um, so some other things is um, depression does uh, sometimes have a connection with suicidality, but it doesn't mean that if someone's depressed that they're suicidal or if they're not depressed that they can't be suicidal. So if you see some signs, they're giving things away. They're like, you know, hey, I gave away my favorite um, Pokemon collection um, to my best friend. And you're like, that's really interesting. Tell me why you did that. Um, and kids who sometimes make a suicide plan, they actually get happier because they feel like there's some sort of a, a release that's happening. I've got a plan. All those things that I'm worried about are not going to be a problem anymore. So you might mistake that for being progress. And like, you know, they were miserable for the last two weeks, they get in your car and suddenly they're super happy. And you're like, wow, this is a big change. So that could be a warning sign. Um, and again, it's okay to ask them. And if, if not, they'll say, no, that's, that's not it. And you'll be like, oh, okay, great. Well, you know, thanks for letting me ask that. Um, does that make sense? So if there's one thing you can go ahead, Barbara. Um, I, I'm a former school counselor. Yes. And I've had really good luck with telling the kids what I'm going to do. Yep. About 50% of the time they say, I'll tell you, but don't tell anybody. And I'll say, um, I'm honored that you trust me. I can't keep this to myself. Like you said, I need help. But this is what I'm going to do. This is what I'm going to say when I call your parents. Yep. And, and they'll... They'll freak, and I'll even invite them to sit in the room with me when I call their parents. Yes. So I'm not going around their back because that's what they hate the most. Yep. And sometimes finding out why they don't want you to tell can be helpful because that's going back to some of those cognitive distortions where they're like, my parents are going to hate me. And you can say, you know, I bet your parents would are really worried and they'd be relieved to hear how you're feeling. Um or if they think, you know, I'm a terrible person for having these thoughts and feelings. And you could say, you know, these are sometimes when people are, you know, really down or something really bad happens in their lives, these feelings can come up. And it's really important that you get some support around this. Um, and you're not alone. A lot of people have felt this way in the past and gotten better. So how can we help? Um, so asking a lot of open-ended questions can sometimes help you 
find ways to navigate if they're like, I, I don't want you to tell anyone. And you say, well, I hear that. And let's, let's find out why. What, what's, what's the struggle with that? Why, what are you worried about? Um, and then you can help them work through some of those things. But ultimately, sometimes in worst case scenario, and I don't come up with this often, usually I can get some buy-in from, from the youth, but sometimes you have to just go ahead and let the parents know your concern. They might get mad at you and that is okay. It's better that they get mad at you. Um, and, and that ultimately, I think you can repair that relationship um, as they, you know, get some help, but. Okay, so, um, oh, go ahead. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so like, with teens, especially I feel like for like the sixth through eighth graders, when they're starting to like find their voice and speak up a little bit more with certain things like um, meditation or sitting down and talk that can definitely be seen as sort of corny or they're not yes. really like trying to open up to those sort of situations. Like, how do you sort of bridge that gap? Because, you know, I understand the benefits of it and I'm, sure, I'm pretty sure that I could like the end result can get there. But then how do I even get to, like saying, hey, guys, that's we're going to sit down for 30 minutes. And we're going to meditate. And then they're going to be like, ah, oh, and do the groans. And obviously it's not going to be it's not going to respond to it well. But you do know that they need it. They're just not seeing the bigger picture because, they're you know, they're in that bubble. Yep. And there are lots of great suggestions on what we can do to help help youth. And sometimes those aren't going to work for them. And if it's not working and, and if I make a bunch of suggestions and they throw them back at me and I'm like, Oh, that's not going to work. That's dumb. I can't do that. Then I'll turn it around to them and say, well, what do you think would work? So how do you calm down the best? And sometimes they'll say things like listening to music and you're like, great. Um, meditation takes many forms. And sometimes um, I'll talk to them about I'll, I'll help them understand what anxiety is in their body. And so um, the sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous systems can't operate at the same time. So if you're feeling really anxious, um, you can manage that by, by doing some things to calm your body down. So sometimes your brain, you can't shut it off, but your body can help you. So if you do some relaxation, um, you know, sometimes that can be really helpful. So letting them understand why meditation is helpful. Sometimes they think it's corny because they're like, oh, that's a stupid yoga thing that people do. And you're like, let me, let me help you understand why meditation works. And it works because it helps you to interrupt some of those thoughts the more you do it. And I tell people that I like to say to kids, it's like a martial art. Um, I'm not going to take a martial art one class and then go up to the black belt in the class and then, you know, try and spar with them. <laughs> I'm going to, that's not going to end well for me. So meditating for 15 minutes and then thinking that's going to save you from a panic attack, not going to happen. You've got, it's a muscle you've got to continue to build. And um, so they need to practice these things. And I'll, again, I'll put it out to the group a little bit. What are some things that you could offer that could be helpful to, to youth? You mean like meditation or what, what do you mean? Meditation, walking in the woods, um, being out in nature, exercise is, is uh, thought to be just as powerful as antidepressants when it comes to uh, managing anxiety and um, managing depression. So getting them out to do some exercise with you, you can trick them. You don't say go out and do some exercise like, hey, you know, I really love going to the batting cages. How about tonight we go to the batting cages and we hit some hit some balls around? Um, but those are also uh, therapeutic things like gardening or art. Yes. Things that they're interested in. Yep. Um, be being with animals. Yeah, you know. Yes. Take them to the local shelter and, and let them, you know, let them hang out with the animals. Um, help care for them. Yeah. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, I've told them to, if they like pets, to, um, in a private setting, talk to their pets and put their thoughts and feelings into words to their pet. And I said, your pet is going to be very confidential and they're not going to spill the beans on anybody. <laughs> but I know that it's helpful 
to just get from the amygdala into your prefrontal cortex and talking it out with your pet is safe. Yep. And that then is they begin to think true. about it. Journaling. Journaling. Really good. Yep. Letting them get their thoughts out and think about things. Um, sometimes as a mentor, like if you want to draw and say, you know, hey, if they like drawing, you know, why don't you draw a picture and show me how you're feeling today? And I'll draw a picture and tell you how I'm feeling today. Um, sometimes helping them pick out what their strengths are, like asking them, you know, what, especially when there's something they're telling you about a situation that didn't go very well. I always find that um, when I'm giving feedback to someone, I can find positives. And if I don't, then I shouldn't do it because there are just as many positives um, as there are negatives. So if they're like, I got no fight at school. Okay. Well, what, what did you do well in that? Um, well, you know, I didn't hit them twice. Well, that's good. So you were <laughs> able to stop yourself when you, when you hit them, that's good. You, you only did that once. So, um, and then find the things that, you know, I told them to stop first. So you find the things that worked and then you say, okay, now what, what could we do differently? What got in your way? So helping them first to find their strengths. Um, and then, and then doing the, and and then helping them think about what can we do differently. And so I think a lot of these conversations don't happen in the moment when they're struggling, but a lot of preventative is like helping them think about it. Um, a lot of their challenges are predictable. Like if anxiety happens a lot when they go into school. So talk about what they're doing and how maybe set some goals with them about, well, what, what things would you like to do? What do you think would make it better? And what could we do um, to practice that. Um, another thing I wanted to say, um, especially with depression, um, getting as a mentor, you already click a very big box by having a supportive adult that they can talk to um, is huge. And that right there is um, a source of resiliency. Um, when they're depressed and they're anxious and they're avoiding, you taking them out and getting them go fishing, taking them out in nature, that is helping them. You are already performing, you know, some really therapeutic things. And with anxiety, sometimes I think also, I like to think of it as, like I said, the amygdala um, is about memories of fear and it looks for and scans for things. So sometimes if we can have the opposite like, you know, if a kid is really afraid of dogs and they have a fear of dogs, um, I might find a dog that's really cute and, and slowly let them pet it. And so it kind of helps them to have a more positive experience. So the amygdala is like, oh yeah, I remember this time that, you know, that didn't happen and it was okay. So um, sometimes the experiences that you, you have, like I'm always a failure, but then you take them somewhere and they find some success you were then helping them to be like, well, remember that time we went bowling um, and you did this really well. You can start using your mentor experiences as evidence against some of their negative thoughts about themselves. Does that make sense? And those are really powerful, helpful tools. I've used with my mentee tons of times where they're like, I just can't talk to people and be like, remember when we went to that Best Buy and you talk to that stranger for 10 minutes about that game you really liked, like that, I'm not sure you're not, you're not always good at talking to people. I hear you that it's difficult sometimes, but I see that you can do it. Um, so really using some of the experiences that you've had with them to help use as evidence against some of the negative thinking that they have. Other questions? We could, this is stuff, there were like, you know, hours and hours of topics in here. And we really kind of did a, a smattering. Um, um, Paul? Yeah. I, I, you know, um, I, you, you've got, you're, you're great. Um, <laughs> um, you. Yeah, really, really I try. great. And, and the, you know, the, those open-ended statements come so easily to you, but I don't know if for others or, and definitely not for me, but I love the open-ended statements and I, and I want a list of them of, you know, tell me more. I mean, you know, starting with tell me mm -hmm. more or what was that like for you or, you know, all, all of the ones you've mentioned that, that 
flow from you so easily tonight, but but I, I'm never quite sure, you know, I, I shouldn't say it. it's they're just not reflexive with me. These things take practice. Um, and uh, I would say start practicing them in your own life. Like, you know, maybe just asking and you find like using open-ended questions with people you care about really can change your relationship sometimes. Because sometimes we get stuck in the, you know, my wife might come back from work and say, oh, I had a bad day. And I say, oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. That's too bad. Yeah. Instead of saying, well, you know, well, what, what, what didn't work about your day today? Um, so, there's, so there's not a list of those. I can get you a life. list for sure. I will post okay. that in, with the okay. uh, PowerPoints. Oh, great. Okay. Or if you could get it to Alice, I can get it from her. Yep. I think if I had a list, I could practice them. I'll, I'll, I'll check them off. It um, almost makes me think it'd be great to have like a poster in the mentoring room with that list, except then all the kids would be rolling their eyes like, oh, yeah, right. now you're asking me number three, yeah, right. you know? Number five, yeah. Thank <laughs> like you, my Paul. own kids would do, yes. Yeah. Thanks, Paul. That would be great. Yeah. Um, I recognize that we're right at time. So I'm going to say if anyone has any questions, I'm going to stick around and I am happy to answer any questions. If there are topics that you felt like, boy, I wish we could cover that. I'm, I'm more than willing to do other presentations or, you know, to spend some more time with a specific topic. Um, so I, you know, like I said, these are, these are topics that we could go on for a very long time about. And so this doesn't have to be our only time that we talk about these things. Um, well, I just want to say thank you. This has been amazing. Thank you so much. Paul. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. Thank you, Paul. This was great. This was great. Yeah, I'm definitely going to use this tomorrow when I <laughs> talk to my kids. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> and Paul, we'll probably bring you back because it's incredible your, the way yeah. you present and this the material that you presented tonight. It's really helpful. It's like the hour and a half was like, I just looked at my watch. It's like, oh my gosh, an hour and a half has flown by. It like, T totally engaging and um, yeah. learned a whole lot. A lot of stuff we've heard before, but hearing it a different way and in mm -hmm. a different context and in a different format was great. That's great. Thank you. It and is. So you'll you'll send out a link to the like CVMN group that we can share with all our um, mentors. Is that it for the presentation and the list of questions? Yep, I'll send that. And if anyone has any more questions, you've got my contact information. Um, and. Uh, don't be afraid. I mean, Alice is very right. A lot of this stuff is out there. Like you can Google any of the open-ended questions and it's going to come out. So I don't, I'm, I want to provide you with those things, but I want you to know um, a lot of that is also out there. So don't be afraid to jump on and, and look around, but um, I encourage you if you know, I think it's great if you can find times with the other mentors to get together and practice some of these things and to talk about, like, even if, you know, um, you know, I just thought of this, I don't know why I'm not doing it with uh, my mentor group, but setting up a, a list server, they can ask each other questions um, and say, you know, I've got this situation generalized, but not giving up confidentiality. What do people think about that? So just setting up a support network where we can all talk about um, challenging things that come up and how we, how we manage those. Great. Any other questions and people feel free to check out when, when you need to go. Um, but I, like I said, if people have questions, I'll stick around. Thank you so much, Paul. This was great. My pleasure. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I couldn't get the PowerPoint to work. So I we don't know like what we don't know. <laughs> I, I, it was a little over the place, but, um, you know, so hopefully you got what you needed. It was, it was great. It really was. PowerPoint right. might've been totally awful. And we're so, you know, we, we <laughs> just only know this. So. All right. There you go. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're very welcome. All right. Oh, I, yeah. I would love to, uh, I would love to like even sort of do like a, just a small learning session around like, okay, so like let's practice something like how do let's say we're in a kind of agitated or anxious physical state let's kind of run through the steps of like okay well let's check in with our body what's happening right now and what is what does that feel like mm -hmm. and what are some things we can do in that moment so that just and I guess like that's Googleable too right and and just practicing that but that seems like that would be so helpful um, for coordinators, 
and then they could kind of pass it around down. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, we're starting a thing in our program with a mood meter. I don't know if you've seen those, like the chart that has all, where you are. And, and our bosses think, Tony, um, your old guy, mm -hmm. was thinking maybe we'd start each session with the kids identifying and the mentors identifying where mm -hmm. they are in the mood meter and why they're there. And then maybe at the end of the mentoring session, where you are and why you're there. And, um, but there isn't that second part of, you know, is this where we want to be? How could we change where we are? Which is something you're getting to as a second part, Amy, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. I think um, a, a good Googleable buzzword is um, grounding techniques. So mm -hmm. um, really things that help them get into the physical space, like, um, like doing a body scan. So right now I can notice that you know, my shoulders are a little tense. I've been leaning over. So my back's a little hurt. So I might adjust myself. Um, I might actively, like sometimes you can use your breath to like when I breathe in, um, I can breathe in. It's kind of interesting, but I can breathe into those tense areas. Right. So I picture my breath going as I breathe in, going to those areas and just asking them questions like, so what do your toes feel like right now? Um, sometimes you can ask them to name, like, what are some of the things that you see around you? So anything to get them into that moment, the, into the here and now versus their thoughts. Um, some people really like box breathing is thought to be very great. And box breathing is you, you take a big breath in, you hold it for four seconds, you let it out and then you hold for four seconds. And there's some amazing apps that can help the calm app. Um, yeah. kids who do virtual reality, I, I love virtual reality right now. I use it for, there's a great meditation app that just takes you to these ma magical places and, um, and, and helps you do that. So box breathing is really good. Um, and it's pretty simple to do going and this is going to sound corny, but going to your happy place, um, picturing someplace that was really safe and warm for you and just spending some time in that. Um, and going back to the brain science, and this is, you know, a mentor tool you can use if you have a kid, especially we're seeing a lot more kids with more intense anxiety and panic, um, in the brain, all the senses are processed through the, the cortex, but there's one sense, which is smell that is, uh, found in the brain right next to your olfactory bulbs are found right next to the amygdala. So for, for some reason that closeness allows, um, that's why with smell, there can be such a strong emotional connection. It has a very quick mm -hmm. connection with the amygdala. Mm -hmm. So sometimes things like carrying a little bit of a, a smell, like um, you can get those little um, bottles of like peppermint, things that kids can smell that's positive. Um, and you can ask some questions like what is you know, right now you're really stressed out when you were happiest, what would that smell like? And they can be like, I smell the ocean air as I was walking along the beach. Um, what did it look like? I can see the sun or, you know, happy people walking around me or the birds or the seagulls. So, um, and explain to them, cause it might sound corny, but explain to them what it's doing is it's helping to bring your parasympathetic mm -hmm. nervous system, right. your calm part back in control of your body versus that fight or flight. Um, and that's really helpful. So finding different grounding techniques like that, sometimes like with cutting or um, self-harm, kids can use ice cubes where if they hold on to an ice cube, mm -hmm. that's not as destructive and it allows them right. to, uh, or rubber bands around their wrists, they can kind of pick at that sometimes, which is better than chewing your nails or, um, right. yeah. So those yeah. are some ways to help calm their bodies down. And yeah, there's tons of stuff, tons of apps, and I'm happy to make a list of those and send those out. Yeah. I mean, we're just seeing so much dysregulation in the schools mm -hmm. right now. I think even the kids who are probably not at the disordered level of anxiety are probably getting to pretty high level of arousal. Yeah. COVID has definitely done that. that. Yeah. So, one one awesome. metaphor. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're very welcome. I'm just going to say one metaphor I like to use with kids is uh, around tolerating feelings is when they run into cold water, it, it's really uncomfortable and it feels awful. Um, but they know 
that it takes your body just a few minutes to get used to it. And then it feels fine. So with anxiety, when things feel scary and you want to avoid them, sometimes just being there and just letting the feelings be there and not having to do anything with them, um, that helps calm the body too, by just taking that step back and saying, um, there's anger, not I am angry or I am mad. It's there's anger and I'm with, you know, depression right now, but they can stand with it and they can tolerate it for longer periods. If they know that it's not going to kill them, it's not going to hurt them, but they can act despite that. And that anxiety does go away. Your body cannot stay in that state. So sometimes I think kids feel like they can't tolerate those things. Um, and they run out of the water very quickly because they're like, oh, that's so uncomfortable. And it's like, well, it is painful, but how much can you stand? Can you stand it for just a few minutes? You don't have to do it all the time, but just a few minutes. And then we'll practice building on that. Yeah. Great. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. This was great. All right, everyone, you're very welcome. I hope you all have a wonderful evening and uh, feel free to reach out with other questions. And like I said, if I can, if we want to talk more about grounding techniques or um, we can, we can dive into some more topics. Excellent. And we'll share everything with our people. Thank you so much. Yes. And I will share this recording with you all. Perfect. Thank you. You're very welcome. Bye -bye. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. Thank you.